Good morning, everyone. It's hard when we see such a large group. And someone at the beginning said you're a brave man to try to go through that whole outline. Or he said you're an ambitious man. I am ambitious if nothing else. I've been asked to speak on the topic of worldviews in the Bible, and I have to see how much room I have to uh, move around. Okay, I don't want to fall over backwards. And I want to pack in as much as I possibly can. My title is Worldviews in the Bible, Reading the Bible Rightly and Discerning False Worldviews. Now, I've been a Christian for almost exactly 36 years and have been studying the Bible and other worldviews and apologetics and culture for nearly all that time. It took me a few months to get started. So what I'm going to say comes out of my life, out of my research, my teaching, my writing, my debating, my evangelistic and apologetic conversations with people. And I hope and pray that you will take it to heart and view this as perhaps for some of you a first step into a deeper knowledge of God and how the knowledge of God pertains to Christian witness in the contemporary world. First of all, what is a worldview? A worldview is basically your philosophy of life. A little more technically, it's a conceptual system, or it is the scheme of things, or the big picture. If you want to sound very impressive, you can say it's a meta-narrative. What is the story of the universe and everything? Now, a worldview answers certain perennial, deeply human, and oftentimes deeply distressing or vexing questions, such as, what is the ultimate reality? What is the primary fact of existence? Is it merely the universe, as naturalism teaches, which we'll talk more about in a moment? Is it Allah, one God, who has no son? That's Islam. Is it the triune God of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament? God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three in one, forever blessed. Is it many gods, as Mormonism teaches? Now, I cannot cover every worldview. I'm not that ambitious. To be that ambitious would, in fact, be stupid. But I am going to cover naturalism and pantheism. Pantheism says the ultimate worldview is the ultimate Reality in their worldview is God. So they would agree with us, but their understanding of the deity is radically, titanically different than the biblical understanding. They believe God is a universal force or principle or consciousness. We'll get back to that. So, first, what is the ultimate reality? Second, does life have a purpose? Does it have a meaning? Is it going anywhere? Recently, I was in Boulder to speak to a philosophy class, and amazingly, the philosophy class at Boulder, CU Boulder, was using my book, Christian Apologetics, as the textbook. It was a one-hour class. Yeah, go ahead, give it up. <laughs> Somebody's got to get excited about apologetics. You can yell and scream about football, friends. Anyway, they were using my text and the professor, Bradley Monton, who is a unbeliever, an atheist, came in and asked me, or told me to come in and teach his class. So I was there for two hours, talking to Christians, atheists, agnostics, about why I think the Christian worldview is true, rational, and perfect the whole life. And I was talking about the Christian worldview as giving purpose to life. History is going somewhere. Life has intrinsic meaning given by a personal, moral, rational God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All things were made through Him. And He became flesh in Jesus Christ. And Brad, professor, was sitting next to me. And I said, now naturalism has a very different perspective. Naturalism asserts that it's just stuff happens. Actually, I used a, a more colloquial word for Boulder. Uh, you may have seen it on bumper stickers in the Presbyterian Church. We want to uh, repeat that word. But I said, for naturalism, stuff happens. There's no purpose. There's no meaning to life. And I said, Brad, is that right? But, mm -hmm. Very different. Thirdly, who are human beings? 
Are we made in the image and likeness of God? Do we have God within ourselves? The teachings of pantheism. Are we merely dust in the wind? The teachings of naturalism. Are we gods in the making? Mormonism. Fourth, is there an afterlife? Naturalists say no. You die, you're buried, you're incinerated, or eaten by worms or other vermin of postulate. I was going to try to pull that off. Vermin <laughs> who enjoy our posthumous state. <laughs> Fifth, what is the basis or meaning of ethics? Is everything relative to the person or relative to the culture? Is morality based on God? Is it Allah? Is it the Trinity? Is it some unknowable universal force? These are worldview questions. And in one way or another, everyone asks these questions. And everyone, at some level, attempts to answer them. The problem is that in distracted postmodern America, where ADHD has gone systematic, we don't think carefully about these things quite often, even Christians. My job today is to try to explain to you basically what the biblical worldview is according to certain categories and then compare it to philosophical naturalism and pantheism. And along the way, I will be giving some arguments against philosophical materialism and pantheism. And, be and also, also, I will talk about how these worldviews will read the Bible, given their perspective on life, their scheme of things. What do they make of the 66 books? of Holy Scripture. The purpose of this is to make you more alert. I've been studying Hosea recently. I'll be preaching on that next week in my church, Gold Spring Anglican Church. And the primary sin of God's people that is addressed in Hosea, particularly Israel, is not acknowledging God. And so many of us know verse 6 of chapter 4. My people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. We need the knowledge of God, who God is, what He has done, what He will do, in relation to false philosophies, religions, and worldviews. Right? My people perish for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. And what is the answer? Acknowledge God. Realize who God is. Have reasons for your beliefs and then embody and incarnate your beliefs in a world of religious diversity. With your mind on 10 or 11. That is, meaning, employ your rational faculties to their utmost for the glory of God according to good reasoning and biblical truth. Now, what is a biblical worldview? First of all, let me point out a problem. Not a problem, really a kind of crisis and an irony. This is from George Barna. Barna survey examines changes in worldview among Christians over the past 13 years. Now let me show you what George Barna defines as a Christian worldview. And then he, in his research, studies the percentage of Americans as a whole and people who identify as Christians pertaining to what whether or not they have a biblical worldview. For the purpose of this survey, a biblical worldview was defined as believing that absolute moral truth exists, the Bible is totally accurate in all of the principles it teaches, Satan is considered to be a real being or force, not merely symbolic, a person cannot earn their way into heaven by trying to be good or do good works, Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth. And God is the all-knowing, all-powerful uh, all creator of the world, who still rules the universe today. Now that is their description of a biblical worldview. Overall, the current research revealed that only 9% of all American adults have a biblical worldview. Now realize that over 90, probably about 95% of people, including children, believe there is a God or a higher power, but they do not have a biblical Christian worldview, account of existence, perspective on life. 
So we have a lot of God words out there that do not really attach themselves to objective reality. Now it gets worse. Arda claims that for people who he identifies as born-again Christians, less than one out of every five, 19%, had such an outlook on life. So 19% of people who Arna identifies as born-again Christians adhere to this description of the Christian worldview. Now that should really make us weak. And you have to understand how ironic this is. Does our federal, state, or local government ban the Bible? Have you ever gone to jail for preaching the gospel? Maybe some of you have, but not probably as Americans. I'm hearing so many bizarre sounds. Uh, I tell the president I'll get back to him later. Now, I would really appreciate it if every person could become pre-modern and turn off all of their electronic devices, except pacemakers. You're a hard crowd so far. All right, people, this is very serious. And actually, this is one of the reasons why we don't learn. We're distracted by all of our technology. We are, all, we are multitasking most of the time, and unitasking very seldom. We need to unitask knowing God and knowing His Word and applying the Word to the world. We have a superabundance of Bibles, of books about the Bible, of teachers, of preachers, on every medium you can imagine. What the heck is wrong with us? 19% adhere to a biblical worldview. It gets worse. I'm good at this, but it gets worse. Barna's understanding of a worldview is emaciated. It is minimalist. He doesn't mention the Trinity. He does not mention justification by faith alone. He does not mention both heaven and hell. Good night, people. Your Presbyterians are close to it. It's a creedal <laughs> tradition, as is more my tradition, the Anglican tradition. We have creeds. There are church councils. There are catechisms. Anybody can dust one off and use one with some kids. There are catechisms to learn basic affirmations of Christianity. This is milk toast. And only 19% of Americans, according to Barnum, let's double it to be generous. Let's say it's 38%. It's still a scandal. It's still a sin, and it must be dealt with. I know you're Presbyterians, but can anybody say amen? Amen. All right, you're awake. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I mean, this is bad news. All right, what is a biblical worldview? We've got to, we must address this scandal of the lack of a Christian mind. First of all, a biblical worldview is based on the Bible. This is epistemology. The Bible is the ultimate source for our knowledge of God, the cosmos, salvation, history, the afterlife, anthropology, and so on. Now by that I mean the Bible rightly interpreted and where you understand what the Bible is teaching. Sometimes people press the Bible to teach things it does not teach. Like the exact age of the universe. The Bible never says exactly how old the universe is, but it certainly says that God created it, He created it for a purpose, and that He communicates truth to the world. This has much more than that. So we view the Bible as, to use the terms of systematic theology, special revelation, or inscripturated revelation. There's a general revelation in nature and conscience that everyone knows by virtue of being human. But then there's a specific, special revelation in the scripture. In scripturated, it has been written down for us and handed down to us that we may know it, that it may indwell us, and that we may make it known to a watching and wasting away world. Now, there'll be much more teaching on the basis of our belief in the Bible is true, 
how we interpret it, and so on later in the series. But I am making the foundational point that the scripture gives us our bearings. It is the anchor for our souls. Let me read you a very well-known verse on this. 2 Timothy 3.15 and 16. Paul says to Timothy, From infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Verse 17. So that the man of God, man or woman of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you see the comprehensive nature? The Bible should be at the center of our knowledge. We should be living, walking, talking, radiating Bibles. Because the Bible has taken root in the depth of our being, and it guides our thoughts. Paul talks about taking every thought captive to obey Christ. How do we know the thoughts of Christ? Through the Scripture as the Holy Spirit illuminates us and applies biblical truth to the entirety, the totality of life. We need to read the Bible according to the author's intentions. We take into consideration the context literarily and culturally. Meaning, the Bible is not a wax nose. You twist it any way you want to. There is an objective given meaning to the text. And this requires study. And many people have said a text without a context is a pretext for error. So you look at a text, in its context, what kind of literature is it? Epistle? Wisdom literature? Historical material? Apocalyptic? What is it? You see the flow of the argument, or the flow of the basic structure of the text, and you also consider what those words would have meant to the original hearers. So you see that God expects us to learn some history, some literary interpretation, to develop our vocabulary. C.S. Lewis said being a Christian is an education in and of itself. He was right. We do not want to deconstruct the text as postmodernists do. To deconstruct a text can mean many different things, sadly. But deconstruction says there is no one objective, knowable meaning to a text. That is the author's intention. Texts have an indefinite number of meanings. And what a text means is largely dependent on your subjective response to it. Now, we even do this in Bible studies sometimes as evangelicals. What does the text mean to you? What does the text mean to you? First of all, you say, what does the text mean to God? He wrote it. What is the Bible teaching? What is it teaching? Now, if you've got the meaning down of this text in relation to the rest of Scripture, then you say, how does this apply to my existential situation? But you cannot, you must not skip the first step. Otherwise, you are reading the Bible foolishly. And it does not honor God. Amen. Amen brother. <laughs> Seminary graduate I talked to earlier. <laughs> I never went to seminary, but don't tell anybody. Now you see, if you don't take into consideration the objective meaning of the text, the authority of the text is abrogated. What if your boss comes to you and says, I need you to work two hours overtime tonight or you get fired? And you say, well, I don't like that. He means take two hours off and get a pay raise. I like that meaning. What does that say about the authority of your employer? You don't respect it. You don't appreciate it. It also means you're dumb. And we do not want to be dumb. You know, Scripture calls us to be fools for Christ. And that means to be willing to be ridiculed and persecuted and even martyred for the cause of Christ. It does not call us to be idiots. Amen. Amen. This Presbyterian group is eating up. <laughs> All right. Now, worldview essentials. And I am already, as usual, battling my enemy. Someday I'll teach in Africa, this won't be a problem. <laughs> Worldview essentials. One, 
creation. God created the heavens and the earth by his word according to his sovereign power and goodness. Creation and the creator are not one as pantheism. It's not just nature without a God as naturalism. It's not some evolved God created his own universe. That's Mormonism. God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth according to his plan and his rational capacity. Or John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and all things were made through Him. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. Verse 18 of John. And He, the Word, that means Jesus Christ, has made the Father known. It's one of the most important verses in all of Holy Scripture. John 1.18, the Son has made, or the Logos has made the Father known. He has given us knowledge of our Creator, our Redeemer, our Sustainer, our Judge, the Lawgiver, the Worker of Miracles. Friends, we need the knowledge of God, not mere opinion, not guesswork, not being flippant with Holy Scripture or flippant with the Christian faith. But we need a Spirit-led intellect that penetrates to the heart of Scripture. God is the Creator. And he has made himself known through Jesus Christ. Secondly, we think of the fall. Why did Christ come? To redeem his erring, sinful creation. God entrusted our first parents with the knowledge of himself and the world and said, get busy developing the world and loving each other and loving me. And our first parents disobeyed, were kicked out of the garden. And we see the effects of that ever since. There's something wrong with everything in this world. Except Jesus Christ. So we cannot earn our way to salvation. We cannot climb a ladder into heaven. You get nowhere. You never finish. In fact, you never get started. Because our righteousness in and of ourselves is but filthy rags to God. Nevertheless, God continues to persevere in loving his sinful parent, willful creation. You see this right after the fall. He makes provisions for Adam and Eve. He gives them clothes. He doesn't destroy them. He continues to reveal himself through the prophets, through nature. The promise of the Messiah fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who takes away the sins of the world. So we have creation, fall, redemption through the work of God, top down, not bottom up. We are so incapacitated by sin that we cannot possibly earn or merit salvation. Moreover, we cannot find God somehow latently within ourselves. This is the teaching of pantheism. Paul says, in me dwells no good thing in the flesh that is. And consummation, God will judge and purify and protect and purify, his, perfect rather, his world in the end. And you have some great texts on this in Revelation 21 and 22. What makes heaven heaven? God. I was once asked by a newspaper, you remember those things? I was asked by a newspaper reporter about some book on heaven called Lovely Bones. I said, well, I haven't read the book. What does it say? Because it gives a description of heaven. And I said, where's God? I said, well, the book really doesn't talk about God. Well, heaven is heaven because God is there. All right? God will make his dwelling place with men and women in a restored universe. All that is good will be protected, will be preserved, the evil will be purged and judged, and God will make his dwelling place with us in a paradise of culture forever. That's consummation. And we are headed in that direction. In the fullness of time, Christ came, Galatians 4, 4. And he came to live a perfect life, to teach, to preach, to cast out demons, to heal, to love the unlovable, and to die on a cross for his enemies. And he said, it is finished. He was buried. He rose from the dead on the third day, just as he said, as the Lord of life. He taught his disciples and others for another 40 days. He ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father, for once he will come again to judge the quick and the dead. There is an afterlife. There is a great parting of the ways. 
eternal punishment for our own sin, or eternal redemption and restoration through Jesus Christ, which is offered to us by grace and we accept by faith. Let's talk about some other worldviews briefly. Two competing worldviews, naturalism or philosophical materialism. It dominates elite culture in America and in the West. Now you might say, this doesn't sound too good, philosophical materialism. You just told me a few moments ago that about 90 to 95 percent of Americans believe in God or higher power. How does that work? Let me invoke the uh, sociologist Peter Berger, who said that America is like a nation of East Indians governed by a small elite of Swedes. <laughs> now, do you know what that means? East Indians, residents of India, are probably the most religious people in the world. Not in a Christian sense, just in holding to religion. Yet the elites in American culture, the professors, many of the scientists, the journalists, and so on, really the gatekeepers of society, tend to be far more secular than the average population. Now, average member of the population. So who really controls the flow of information in our culture to a large degree? It's the university. It's the journalists. You will be taught philosophical naturalism at every level of public schooling in the United States, from kindergarten up. What is it? The worldview claims that nature is only material. This is also called physicalism. And there's nothing outside of nature. So if Christianity is a two-circle worldview, you have God, and then you have a circle underneath it, meaning creation, and there's a distinction between the two. Also a connection through the incarnation in God's presence. Naturalism wipes out, erases, eradicates God, and says there's only nature, and nature is only the product of what can be described by chemistry, biology, and physics. This means, of course, there is no revelation from God, because God is not there. There is no immaterial soul that lives on after death, or that can perceive God. <coughs> there are no miracles, because natural laws cover everything and have no exception. You want to understand something, think about the laws that we have, chemistry, laws of chemistry, biology, physics. And of course, there is no afterlife. You're an organism that evolved for no reason over a long period of time, and you will die, and that's the end of you, because you are nothing but your brain. Your consciousness is reducible to your brain. Your brain stops working and starts decaying, and that's it. Like turning off a light switch, or destroying a light bulb. Philosophical naturalists believe that religion is a useless or perhaps a dangerous superstition. And in recent years, we have had a whole chorus of new atheists telling us that we shouldn't put up with religion. We shouldn't give it a pass. We should attack it because it's wrong, it's evil, and it distorts people's views of reality and leads to a less, less aware and intelligent civilization. Now, a few problems with naturalism, very quickly, and the big book, Christian Apologetics, goes into this in much, much more detail. Naturalists are very uncomfortable with the Big Bang cosmology. And there's very strong physical, scientific evidence that the universe came into existence out of nothing a finite time ago. That is, there was nothing, and then there was the universe. Now, what are you going to do with that? Some naturalists say, well, there was something really before the Big Bang. But there couldn't be, because there wasn't even space before the Big Bang, so there'd be no place for it to be. Anyway, they come up with these theories, and Krauss has a new book about how everything can come out of nothing, but he's an atheist. What he does is he, he sneaks in a covert something from which everything comes. The guy's a horrible philosopher. Let me tell you the worst philosopher out there who's a physicist, Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking's latest book says, we must give up on philosophy for truth and only go to science. No argument, and moreover, that's a philosophical statement. So he's refuted himself. 
Then he also says the universe created itself. Think about that for maybe three nanoseconds. <laughs> the universe created itself. For the universe to create itself, it would have to precede itself in existence in order to bring itself into existence. <laughs> you have had too many margaritas. <laughs> Now, Hawking also says that the universe came out of nothing. Now, how does something come from nothing without a cause? I call this the pop goes the universe thing. But realize this, the universe created itself and the universe came out of nothing are contradictory statements. Neither one of them can be true by themselves. Worse yet, both of them can be true because they contradict each other. So Stephen Hawking has built three logical contradictions into a couple of sentences. That is an amazing achievement. In fact, if I was grading his paper, I'd give him an F cubed. <laughs> because he's got three contradictions in one statement. One could go on. We also have evidence from physics and cosmology that the universe, its laws, its proportions, its constants, are very fine-tuned for life. Life is no accident. You think of all the dial settings on, on dozens and dozens of, uh, let's say, radios. They all have to be adjusted just right with many possibilities on the dial. They all have to be adjusted just right for conscious embodied life to exist. The chances of this happening are infinitesimal. And there is no one natural law that can explain how each dial is tuned with respect to the other tunings. Now again, one could go on. There's a whole chapter in my book on this. What does this indicate? A designing mind. A designing mind calculated what was needed to bring about conscious embodied life and fine-tuned all these principles of nature such that it happened. The naturalists are over the barrel on this one, and they're coming up with some bizarre ideas. They're very implausible. Furthermore, naturalism cannot give meaning to human existence. And humans, as far back as we go in history, have desired meaning. They have feared death. They have wondered about the basis of love. Naturalism says everything boils down to time and space and chance and natural laws that are just there. Stuff happens. That's it. That does not meet the deepest, most fundamental, universal human need for meaning, purpose, and direction. Now what about pantheism, very quickly? Pantheism is the opposite of naturalism. It says that everything is divine. There is no distinction between God and the world. Everything is God, but God is understood to be an impersonal principle force or vibration. You have people like Eckhart Tolle, Deepak Chopra, and many others teaching this. The film, Avatar, taught this basic idea, if you had the misfortune to see that film. This great God, the Hindus call it Brahman, you have to understand, is a total oneness. There's no duality in the world. There's no real distinction between any two things. There's only one thing, the great oneness. So you take an eraser and erase the distinctions between you and the other person. You and the planet, you and the universe, you and God. All is one, and all is God. Naturalism says no God, pantheism says everything is God. Now they have something in common. Their ultimate reality is impersonal and amoral. You see, in the beginning was the particles, were the particles for naturalists, and the natural laws for no reason. The universe is just there, as Bertrand Russell said. You might say, well, the pantheists spiritualize everything, and that gives meaning. Not really, because their concept of God is that of an impersonal, amoral thing, it. In the beginning was the it, and there's still just the it, and you have to get it. It's pantheism. <laughs> Salvation is found within the self, the God within. Now, pantheists will use the Bible, they will misinterpret it. For example, Scripture says the kingdom of God is within you. And alternative translations are the kingdom of God is in your midst. 
People say, you see, Jesus taught that everything was divine. He said, the kingdom of God is within you. Well, first of all, he said, the kingdom of God is within you, not God is within you. There's a difference between the kingdom of God and God. Secondly, what Jesus is meaning in that context is the kingdom has come in me, in my person, in my miracles, in my message. In fact, he's talking to people he disagrees with who have perverted the biblical worldview. So what are people doing here? A text out of context is a pretext for error. This is what Jim Sire in his marvelous book, Scripture Twisting, calls worldview confusion. The Bible teaches the creation, fall, redemption, consummation worldview. Someone with an entirely different worldview, such as naturalism, looks at the Bible and cuts out all the miracles, all the revelation. Can't be true. Pantheist comes and looks at the Bible and superimposes this idea that everything is divine and we are divine and we have unlimited potential. That is simply intellectual dishonesty. You've got to read the Bible for what it says and test it appropriately. People involved with this pantheistic or New Age worldview will say that the Bible teaches reincarnation. Did you know that? Did you miss it? Jesus said, if you can accept it, John the Baptist is Elijah. So John the Baptist is the reincarnation of Elijah. So Jesus teaches reincarnation. So why don't you Christians believe it? Now well, I could, five minutes. I, I wrote a thousand pages against the New Age worldview, but it's very difficult to get it myself. But, we know from Scripture that it is appointed to a man or woman to die once and then comes the judgment. When Jesus said, John is Elijah, he was speaking metaphorically. It's obvious because the Bible teaches resurrection and final judgment, not reincarnation. All right? So he meant it metaphorically. And there are other reasons which I can't go into. But that is another case of Scripture twisting. Now, what about problems with pantheism? It says that everyone is unlimited. Everyone is this divine entity. But folks, if you're anything like me, you experience limitations, problems, difficulties. I couldn't find my contacts this morning. Now, if I'm unlimited and everything is one, that shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> and what about morality? What about the difference between good and evil, virtue and vice, beauty and ugliness? Is that just an illusion? Is everything a universal oneness? That goes against our most basic fundamental knowledge of the world. The I-thou relationship and the good and evil dichotomy. Moreover, pantheism, like naturalism, and I am finishing up or hope to, Pantheism, like naturalism, denies human fulfillment on the basis of relationships. Naturalism said, you're here for no reason, you're preserved for a period of time, and then you die, and eventually, the entire human race goes extinct. And big deal. Really. Pantheism says, the ultimate reality is not a personal God who created the world, designed the world, it's a universal oneness that we really can't discuss. Although they talk about it endlessly. It's a universal something that is beyond the intellect, beyond category. They will even say beyond reason. How in the world can you have a relationship with something that you cannot know? Furthermore, Pantheism distorts the meaning and person of Jesus Christ. Now we know that all wisdom and knowledge is hid in Jesus Christ. He's the firstborn from among the dead. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has all authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth. We know that there is one mediator between God and human beings, the man Christ Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life of salvation found in no one else except Jesus Christ. And he proved it through his life, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. New Agers love Jesus, but get this, it's the wrong Jesus. They redefine him. They say he was a guru, a yogi, a swami, an avatar. And he taught that all is one, and all is divine, and we are divine. And he is a way shower. He's not the way, he's a way shower. He is an example of what we too could achieve. 
Now, folks, there is no biblical, historical, logical basis for this. It is pure worldview projection. You take pantheism, monism, you project it on the text, you distort it, you engage in worldview confusion. This is common in our day. In fact, Deepak Chopra wrote a book called The Third Jesus. The guy writes about a book a week, or somebody does. And he doesn't make any appeal to the Bible as authoritative, nor does he really debunk, debunk the Bible. He just says, we can't go to the Bible, we can't go to receive traditions. And then he paints this picture of Jesus as a guru and distorts the sayings of Jesus and the rest of the Bible every time he quotes them. There's no good reason for this, but it does appeal to the flesh. Because if we are God, then we don't need a Redeemer. We don't need salvation. We don't need to be forgiven of our sin. There's just karma and reincarnation, and eventually we will all attain to the great heaven. Now, folks, what I've done is talk about the importance of a Christian worldview, the lack of a Christian worldview among confessed Christians. I discussed a little bit about philosophical naturalism, what it teaches, some of its weaknesses. I discussed pantheism or new age or new spirituality thought and showed how it distorts the scripture and some reasons that it is not the case. How do we address other worldviews, how do we evangelize and engage in apologetics? We need to explore and develop a Christian worldview that is faithful to Scripture and logic. Meaning we study the Bible, we memorize it, we meditate on it. The Bible should be central in our cognition, in our imagination. It is true. Jesus said in John 17, 17 to God the Father, Your word is truth. Sanctify them in the truth. We can have knowledge of God. Not a blind leap, not a guess. We can have justified true beliefs about God that make a difference in every aspect of our lives. And if these truths are radiating and emanating from us, it will cause some trouble. People will disagree with you. People will not like you sometimes because of your viewpoint. To that I say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And the gospel in some cases will make enemies of people who are enemies of the gospel. So Paul said, we are the savior of life for those who are being saved and the savior of death for those who are perishing. We do not want to impose a naturalistic or pantheistic view on the Bible. We want to let it speak for itself. We need to carefully and critically interpret it. One very quick example. I attended a church once, not this one. Someone was talking about someone that was demonized. The text in the gospel strictly, clearly says a boy was demonized. That is, he was taken over by invisible, evil spiritual entities that the Bible calls fallen angels or demons. The man described the situation as the boy having bipolar disorder. That's the last time we went there. And I contacted the head pastor about this, and he said, well... You know, so-and-so is a counselor, so he tends to put things in those terms. Well, Rudolph Bolton rises from the dead. This was not a mental illness. This was demonization. You see what he was doing? Naturalism. You understand everything through chemistry, biology, physics, and humanistic psychology. You impose it on the Bible. Oh, demon possession. That's just the way those silly pre-modern people thought about things. We're more evolved, enlightened, and knowledgeable. We've read Freud, we've read Jung, we've read all these people, and we have our categories, bipolar disorder. Friends, I'm not denying that bipolar disorder exists, but demonization exists. It's in the Bible. It happens today. Dale Moody said, why do you believe in the devil? He said, first, because the Bible teaches, and secondly, I've done business with him. <laughs> and I find what Dale Moody said in my own case. My own case. Last two points. Discern unbiblical and illogical worldviews and expose them in love. This is what I've tried to do in my book, Christian Apologetics. Have an answer within you that you can give to others when they ask you what you believe and why. That takes time. It takes work. It takes prayer, dependency on the Holy Spirit. And also, lastly, be ready for intellectual and spiritual warfare as you battle to bring people to Christ and build up Christians in knowledge. 
It's dangerous out there. In fact, if we had spiritual eyes to see, we would probably see a bunch of demons around this church just waiting to get in and do as much mischief as possible. So we're in the battle. Ephesians 6 says, put on the full armor of God. You all know what the armor is, so I won't ask you. You don't put on armor to go on vacation. You put on armor to fight. And it includes a sword. And it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the Word of God, Hebrews 4.12 says, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And the Word will accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. It's dangerous out there. There are naturalists. Some of them in pulpits. There are pantheists. Some of them in pulpits. There are Mormons. There are Jehovah's Witnesses. I can't cover everything. There are postmodernists. I wrote a whole book on that. Don't get me started. But this is warfare. Now, you're not battling people. You're battling Satan and demons who have captured people's hearts and lives and minds. We love people. We hate the enemy. But loving people means doing battle against false ideas and everything that raises itself up against the knowledge of God, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4. There's not a distinction between spiritual warfare and intellectual argument. According to Paul. So when you are advocating Christianity, it will be opposed. You stand up, you stand out, you get injured, you lick your wounds, you go back to the scripture, you go back to study, you go back out there and go back. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Amen. You Presbyterians are <laughs> Amen's all over the place. Alright, I'm out of time. Now, whoever's in charge, can I take some question time? Or shall we brutally enforce the time restriction? <laughs> Bruce? Pastor Bruce? He's, he's ordained, you know. <laughs> I don't know the percentage, but a pretty high rate because I've done it for so long and I know how to do it. There's an art to writing a letter to the editor. In fact, go to my blog. I've got an essay on that, how to write letters at the end. Okay, just uh, maybe yeah, time for just a, a couple, maybe three of the most questions here, real quick. Uh, you had your hand up first. You're going to defer to the lady here. Um, I have, my question is, the Holy Spirit within you, can you explain that differing from pantheism? Yes, pantheism says everything is divine, and there's no distinction between the creator and the creature. Now, the Holy Spirit lives within the believer, but we have not always had the Holy Spirit within us. And the Holy Spirit lives within us. There's us and there's the Holy Spirit. They're not one thing, you see. We're reconciled to God through the achievements of Jesus Christ. We're justified and that we are sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit within us. But we are not one thing. It's relational. And we want that relationship to be as deep and profound and, and is satisfying in every way so we can manifest the kingdom of God. So, so Paul will say, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I can do all things through Christ. And Jesus says before he ascends in Acts 1 8, wait for the Holy Spirit to come to give you the power for witness. The Holy Spirit works within and manifests without. But I am not the Holy Spirit. Neither are you. I know this with absolute certainty. But the Holy Spirit is here. And he's within believers. This isn't a question, though. It's just a very brief illustration of your point regarding naturalism. I've got a friend who is a PhD professor at God help us, Harvard. Mm -hmm. His field is very arcane. It's biostatistics. Through his work, he became a believer. Right. He, I asked him once, how can I get an illustration of people about as you pointed out, the laws of chemistry, biology, and physics don't disprove God. They prove God. He said, I'll give you an easy one. He said, imagine the state of Texas. Imagine it filled to 30 feet high, which is higher than this room, with quarters. Then imagine putting a penny randomly somewhere in there. He said, the chance that the Bible is not true in its appreciation and exegesis of chemistry, biology, and physics is like reaching into the 30 foot high entire state of Texas pile of quarters and coming up with a penny on the first one. The statistics are against naturalism for the origin of life, for the development of life, 
for the fine tuning of the universe. And it's so exciting. I've been a Christian for 36 years now. In the last, I'd say, 15 to 20 years, I've seen the case for Christian theism become stronger and stronger in the elite culture, among scientists, among philosophers. This is not a time to shrink back. This is a time to dig in, to stand up and stand out and speak up. Get busy. Okay, and on that note, I think we're going to uh, call time here. Uh, you'll find the answers to the rest of your questions in, in yes. Doug's books. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I would encourage you to, uh, to, uh, to get, get your hands on them and, uh, and start, start reading. We're students, students of the Word. And uh, uh, don't forget to, uh, to, to sign up. If you want, if you want the series, you want to wait until we have all these on, this, on a series uh, in a, all together. Well, be sure to sign up back there. Or if it is that you just want, kind of pick and choose certain ones and pick them up the following week, why? Just make sure that's clear. Uh, but don't forget that it's also on, on our website now, so that might save some of you uh, if you don't want to purchase one to, uh, to listen to it that way. Um, let's uh, give a hand of appreciation. Missed uh, for those of you who uh, we have uh, worship to uh, beginning in about five minutes, and uh, to the rest of you that have already been to worship this morning, uh, let's worship the Lord uh, the rest of the day. It's His day. God bless you.